We are going to have a look at Starship Troopers and examine the question of when is war justified on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. When it comes to theories about warfare, there are three questions to answer. When, why, and how. And there are three broad schools of thought on this question. Those are pacifist, realist, and just war approaches to the idea of war. The realist and pacifist positions tend to occupy either end of the spectrum about warfare, while the just war position seeks to find a middle ground between the two extremes. It's worth keeping a few things in mind as we look into the idea of warfare. Firstly, we really need a definition of war. What is it? Traditionally, war might be considered a state of armed conflict between states. It might be reasonable to consider war as an interaction between at least two groups of human beings and can be fought over ideological differences, resources, land, and other sorts of things. The German military theorist Karl von Clausewitz described war in two different ways. He said, War is an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. And his more famous maxim, War is merely the continuation of policy by other means. Von Clausewitz's two definitions are probably the most useful, as they would manage to cover many of the different sorts of conflicts we're familiar with be they warring nation-states, civil wars, the war on terror, and other such conflicts. Suffice to say, for the purposes of discussion, let's call something a war if it has a large group of belligerents bent on getting their enemy to bend to their will, even if what is willed is simply, stop attacking us and leave us alone. One other thing to keep in mind when thinking about warfare is a conflict between different cultures that place different values on different things. This is starkly illustrated in Starship Troopers when the Roughnecks are lured into a trap by the Arachnids, and then their position is attacked by a horde of bug warriors. The Arachnids think nothing of sending massed wave attacks of warriors, and use the piled bodies of their own warriors to effect entry into the fortification, while the Federation will risk the flight crew of a rescue boat, and the boat itself, to put down in extremely dangerous conditions to effect the rescue of a small number of mobile infantry troopers something that probably wouldn't even occur to the bugs to do. Although the movie presents an extreme example, we see similar things in merely human conflicts today. Some militaries even have specially created search and rescue groups whose sole task it is to bring injured and lost soldiers to safety, even when an entire flight crew of five or six men will be risked to save the life of one other soldier. There are no acceptable losses. War may be dangerous, and it's accepted that not everybody may make it home, but great effort will be gone to, to make sure everybody does. This doesn't seem like a concept the bugs would, would recognise, and various human regimes have behaved and treated their soldiers in a similar fashion. By comparison, the arachnids would go to vast lengths to protect their brain bug, with no sacrifice too great in lesser lives to ensure its protection. This collective versus individual value of life, and castes, versus a more egalitarian approach will make for quite a different approach to when warfare is acceptable and how it may be waged. Back to the three broad schools of thought on warfare. The first of these, pacifism, has some differences of opinion, but the basic idea is that war is never an acceptable option. Some pacifists would make an exception for a purely defensive war to stop an aggressor but generally speaking, war may never be initiated and any other means to a solution is preferable to resorting to armed conflict, regardless or almost regardless of the cost. Pacifists can be pacifists because of an underlying principle or for pragmatic reasons. Usually whichever sort of pacifist is encountered, the justification will revolve around the horror and barbarity of war, whether in principle or just in practice. The pacifist is inevitably going to see von Clausewitz's other means as always or nearly always unacceptable as a means of solving disagreements. 
pacifists can let their pacifism extend to different levels, all the way down to their personal life, or just regard pacifism as the correct approach for the behaviour of nation-states. It's also possible to just adopt pacifism as a smokescreen to achieve some other goal, as we saw with anti-war protests during the Vietnam War, which largely evaporated with the sensation of the draft, or the more recent US conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, with the anti-war protests largely evaporating after a change of presidential leadership and the protesters getting their guy in charge. It would seem for the pacifist in general, questions of how to wage a war and how to settle a peace are irrelevant, as it should never reach that point in the first place. Next we come to a school of thought that's called realism. A realist essentially tries to take von Clausewitz's maxim very seriously. He sees resorting to the use of force as completely legitimate when it can be used to achieve a suitable political end. The realist also thinks, unlike the pacifist, that moral rules have no place in the interaction between states, that state actors, whatever pretense they may put on, should behave in an utterly amoral fashion and aim only at their own advantage. That all the moral niceties should be left at home, where things are safe and there are policemen around to sort things out. The realist will generally see war as a means to an end, and are willing to approve of the use of force, or the threat of force, if it suits their goals. It's worth noting that the realist may approve of things like rules for warfare or offer support for reasonably moral reasons, but ultimately these things will be done because the realist perceives advantage for his nation in doing so. So realism isn't evil as a position, but it can be ruthless and it is extremely pragmatic. Realism and pacifism are two extremes on the spectrum, one informing their thinking with moral principles and the other with a dispensing of morality. Interestingly, I don't think either system is especially moral, and, like a lot of things, the amoral system may achieve more good than a system based in the deeply principled position can. Consider the case of the belligerent dictator who threatens the nations around them and generally represses and harms his subjects. A pacifist committed to the principle that it is never morally permissible to use warfare will likely stand by, maybe send the odd nastily worded protest as the dictator harms his people and invades his weaker neighbours, while the realist may very well put a swift end to the dictator and liberate his people and protect their neighbours because they see this as directly in their interest to do so, which is the worst outcome. Next we get to a theory that seeks to find a middle ground between outright pacifism and the amorality of realism. This position is known as just war theory and has very ancient roots. The 4th century Christian writer Augustine of Hippo sought to look for grounds for warfare using Christian principles, which made a break from earlier, more pacifistic approaches. One of the most important pieces of work on just war theory in Christian philosophy comes from the Middle Ages philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, in his work The Summa Theologiae. It isn't just Christians who have sought to codify rules and warfare, though, as concern over what is allowed and disallowed in warfare goes back to ancient pagan writers, including writers in India in the Mahabharata and the Roman statesman Cicero. In just war theory, there are six criteria that must be met before it is legitimate to resort to warfare. The technical name for these criteria is the jus ad bellum. Some thinkers argue over whether all six of the criteria must be met to legitimately wage a war, but on the whole, it would seem that the criteria are very reasonable. The first criteria is the most important, and that requires that the party wishing to start a war have a just cause. What constitutes a just cause can be difficult to determine, but generally it requires that you be acting to defend yourself or others from the aggression of a belligerent. Whether that be to stop a belligerent state, such as Britain fighting the Nazis, or the US and others driving the Iraqi army out of Kuwait in the first Gulf War, or stopping ethnic cleansing, as happened with UN peacekeepers in Serbia and Croatia. There are lots of things that can qualify as a just cause, but defence of some sort is usually a factor. Next we come to the requirement of right intention. It's no good to have a just cause that you claim to be fighting for if you have some ulterior motive that is what really drives you to armed conflict. Even if the cause is just, eyeing off someone else's resources and engaging in the just conflict in the hopes of acquiring them 
in the piece is regarded as illegitimate. Interestingly, in international law, the concept of right intention is actually omitted. It's probably reasonable they do this, as it's always possible to impugn someone's motives, even when it would be irrational for them to try to go along with the supposed ulterior motive. There is also a requirement that the war be publicly and properly declared, and done so by appropriate authority. It isn't just if an illegitimate authority tries to declare war, or the war is started via a sneak attack. Consider the condemnation still attached to the Pearl Harbor sneak attack by the Japanese in World War II, and that was likely only a sneak attack due to a communications error. Fourthly, there is a requirement of a war being a last resort. This is a problematic criteria, because there will always be some who are quick to want to go to war, and others who will be unwilling to go to war even when the realistic hope of diplomacy being effective is long gone. Still, it's a reasonable requirement, and the general consensus in just war theory is that you cannot legitimately go to war until other means have reasonably been tried and have failed. Fifth, there is a requirement of a reasonable probability of success. This is another criteria that is missing from international law, because it would disqualify a smaller, weaker state from choosing to fight a would-be aggressor nation. Given the cost of war, it may not be an absolute requirement, but it's probably a criteria worth considering and factoring in. Finally, there is a requirement of proportionality. A state must weigh up the good results expected from choosing armed conflict versus the harms that will result from engaging in conflict and also the harm that will result from doing nothing. If the proposed methodology in waging an otherwise legitimate war to remove an oppressive regime requires that the nation being attacked be carpet-bombed into a glassy plain with nuclear weapons, killing nearly everybody in the country, probably reasonably asserted that it might be better not to declare war, as the cost of exterminating the other population is too high relative to the benefit achieved, especially if the goal is the liberation of the populace in question. If all six of these criteria are met, then a just war may be declared and waged. Although meeting all six of these criteria is likely to prove quite difficult, the Allies in World War II could probably be plausibly said to have met the six criteria in fighting the Axis, and the first Gulf War was explicitly argued for along these lines, but many other conflicts in history are going to have a hard time passing muster. This brings to an end part one of our exploration of when it is acceptable to wage a war. Next time we will continue and look at questions of how to wage a war and how to settle a peace. You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. I can also be reached with comments via the scifishow at gmail.com. You can leave comments in the show notes at scifishow.com. And you can also leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash sci-fi show. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. Let me know what you think. The Sci-Fi Show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license, and the music is provided by Furious J and Maniacal M. Music